Originally founded in Richmond, Indiana, 1851, as the Nordyke and Ham Company, they would build grain and flour machinery. In 1866, guy by the name of Daniel Marmon would join the firm. They would be renamed as the Nordyke and Marmon Company. Daniel and his wife, Elizabeth Carter, would have two sons, Walter and Howard, which would get into the automotive business in 1902. They were known for building reliable upscale cars. Fast forward to 1931, Marmon would offer the 16. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like, the automotive channel that dives in and features cars that don't often get talked about. Maybe cars that are being lost to time. History, specs, design. Sometimes it's like seeing these cars for the very first time. Post between four and five episodes each week with engine episodes generally on Wednesdays. This week's engine episode is premiering right after this episode. It doesn't usually happen that way, but I figured let's try something different. If automotive history sounds of interest to you, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. According to the calendar, spring is finally here. If you have a car from your personal collection that you'd like featured on the channel, drop me a line at what underscore it's underscore like at Yahoo. I know who has a Yahoo email anymore. Dot com, especially looking in the western Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, southern Michigan, eastern Indiana, surrounding areas. If interested, drop me a telegram, I mean email. Founded in Richmond, Indiana, 1851 by Addison Nordyke, originally called Nordyke Ham and Company. They were in the mill business, making machinery for mills for grinding grains and later would build flour mills. In 1866, Daniel Marmon joined the firm and the name changed to Nordyke Marmon Company and would move to Indianapolis in 1875 because there was better manufacturing and shipping opportunities, mostly the facilities. Remember, it's all about location. The Quaker City Works was purchased in 1876. The firm grew and became America's top mill builder. Daniel Marmon and Elizabeth Carter would have two sons, Walter and Howard Marmon who began looking around at all the cars being made at that time period and thought they could do a car better than what everybody else was doing with their eyes closed, just like Packard, Pierce Arrow. But just like those stories, they set out to build the best car on sale in America during that time. Both Walter and Howard, as well as their father Daniel, had degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, and would build their first car in 1902. With the creation of their first car, Marmon Motor Company was born. Howard would serve as the engineer slash chief design, while Walter was in charge of the finances and manufacturing. Their vision, their goal was to build a superior car, money no object. Quickly, they would gain a reputation for building quality and reliable cars. In the early days, they built air-cooled cars with different cylinder configurations, overhead valve, 90 degree V4. They even built an experimental V6 in 1906. They built a 75 horsepower V8 in 1907. In 1908, Marmon would build the Model 32. Ray Heron, who was a Marmon engineer, would drive a Model 32 Marmon powered by a six cylinder for just one race called the Wasp and would win the Indianapolis 500 in 1911. It's important to note, this was the first time that anybody ever used a rear view mirror. He is the guy that started that trend. And because he didn't have to ride with a mechanic because the mechanic's job back then was to notify the driver of a car about to pass, he could just simply look up, his car weighed less, he won the race in 1911. Marmon would use a lot of aluminum in body parts, engine parts. Most cars used cast iron, which was the plastic of its day. Aluminum wasn't quite understood yet, often called trouble metal. 
It's worth mentioning Marmon wasn't the only company using aluminum. Franklin was using aluminum as well. It just wasn't as commonplace as cast iron. In 1916, model 34 with aluminum inline six, aluminum body and aluminum chassis was driven coast to coast and beat Irwin Cannonball Baker's record. Fun fact, Henry Ford was driven in a Marmon until he bought Lincoln in 1922. By the mid-1920s, luxury car companies started offering more and more cylinders, the Cylinder Wars. Just to be clear, these cars with V12s, V16s, doesn't mean that it puts out a ton of power. Case in point, the Duesenberg Model J was the most powerful engine of the day. Eight-cylinder with a supercharger. Luxury companies would offer six, eight, V8, V12, they skipped over V10 for some reason. I can't think of any car company from the mid-20s to 30s American car with a V10. Very interesting. Anyway, more cylinders doesn't equal more power. It equaled more smoothness. The V12 and V16s were essentially, in a lot of cases, two individual engines that share the same crankshaft. They have two distributors, two coils, and the Marmon V16 design started off like that. Marmon wanted to offer a V16 before anybody else. Howard Marmon would start working on the V16 as early as 1926 which he projected a deadline of 1930. Howard Marmon wasn't the only Marmon engineer working on this project. Two other key people that were in on this project was Owen Knacker and James Bowen. Both Cadillac and Peerless were also developing a V16 of their very own. Each company working to be the first to have that title that comes with being the first. Owen Knacker would leave Marmon to go to Cadillac and help them get theirs to market first. John Bowen went to Peerless. Timing wasn't good, though. These were expensive, head-of-state cars. In 1929, the stock market would crash, leaving the poor broke and everybody else struggling. Peerless didn't make it. One prototype that looks totally different from the Marmon and the Cadillac V16s was built. The Cadillac V16 made its debut in 1930, and it looks very modern for the time period. Overhead valve rated between 165 to 175 horsepower. Marmon came out one year later, 1931. The engine was made out of aluminum alloy and produced 200 horsepower. The Marmon was quick, said to accelerate faster than a Duesenberg Model J, which was the fastest car in the world during this period in time. It was one of the only American cars that could do that, but it only topped out at 105 miles an hour, while the Duesenberg Model J could go 120 miles an hour. But it could accelerate faster than the Duesenberg for a fraction of the cost. It's almost like a brand new Tesla Plaid versus a Bugatti Chiron. Marmon would offer the 16 from 1931 through 1933. They also offered a lower priced car called the Roosevelt, named after Theodore Roosevelt, and sold eight times better than the 16. 1931, Marmon 16 could be had as a chassis. LeBaron bodies include, but not limited to, sports coupe, limousine, four door sedan, convertible coupe, which is our featured car, club sedan. Marmon bodies were five-passenger and seven-passenger sedans. The first Marmon 16 wasn't delivered until April of 1931, with around 400 being produced from 1931 through 1933. Marmon also offered various other series, like Series 70, which rides a wheelbase of 112.75 inches, Series 69 on a wheelbase of 211.2 inches, Series 79, 125-inch wheelbase, Series 88 on a wheelbase of 136 inches, and the Big 8 series on a 136-inch wheelbase as well. In 1931, Walter Marmon saw the changes in the market with the effects of the Great Depression and wanted to keep making money in a market where there wasn't any, would partner with Arthur C. Harrington with an all-new focus in developing military vehicles under government contract. The new company would be Marmon 
Harrington, and they would go on to build 4x4 all-wheel drive vehicles for the war. After the war, they got into building buses and trucks. In the early 60s, Prince Key family would buy the company. The Indianapolis main plant and headquarters was closed in 1963, adopted the name Marmon Group, and was based in Chicago, Illinois. In 2008, Berkshire Hathaway purchased a majority stake in Marmon Holdings, which included Marmon Group and Marming Harrington. Let's talk specs. It rides a wheelbase of 145 inches. It weighs 5,000 pounds. Price, $5,300, which is equivalent to you spending $108,205.78 in the year 2024. Just as a point of reference, this car was cheaper to buy than a 1978 450 SL Mercedes and had more power and real leather seats. Just saying. Total 1931 Marmon was 3,812 units, of which total 1931 Marmon 16 was 223 units. 1932, they only made 111 units. 1933, 56 units for a grand total of 390 units. Some sources say that they made as many as 400 units. Moving on to engine, only one engine on offer, 490.8 oftentimes just referred to as 491 cubic inch displacement overhead valve, 40 degree V16, eight liters. It's good for 200 horsepower, 3,400 RPM. This is an estimated anywhere between 385 to 400 pound feet or 542 Newton meters at 1200 RPM with a bore of 3.1 inches and a stroke of four inches. Compression is six to one built of aluminum alloy backed with a three speed manual transmission. Theoretical top speed of 105 miles per hour. This car featured vacuum assisted mechanical drum brakes on all four corners. This 1931 Marmon 16 is currently on display at Gilmore Auto Museum up in Hickory Corners, Michigan. Also want to give them a huge thank you for giving me the opportunity to feature this car on the channel. So if you'd like to check this car out in person, you can totally do so for hours of operation and directions to Gilmore as well as admission prices. Be sure to click the link below after the show. Let's talk styling. Just wow. Look at this radiator shell. It doesn't look like chrome. It looks like stainless. It could be nickel, but it just gives off. You can see everything in this grill. And it looks like it might be thermostatically controlled as well. Dual horns, one on each side. The headlights. Are massive here's my hand for reference my hand seven and a half inches long look at how these fenders are designed also notice there isn't a bead or anything they just get real thin towards the edge. How it flows with the side mount on the side of the fender and then down into the running board. This car is sitting on bias ply tires, 7.0018. This one has louvers. Beautiful side mount, wire wheels. So see how it's connected to the car. This has a spotlight on both sides, dueling spotlights. Cowls on both sides. Windshield is a single piece. Windshield wipers are at the top and notice the bar that connects the other one.
the running boards are pretty, pretty thick. There's my foot for reference. I wear size 12 shoe. And then it tapers, tapers in the back quite drastically, but my size 12 shoe can still fit on there. Just look at how pronounced these beads are on the running board itself. Rear fender is just like the front fender. It just gets thinner. It's not really rolled. It just ends, but it ends thinner. And then kicks out the back. This car has a luggage rack to put a external trunk on. Also has a rumble seat. These are step pads to get into the rumble seat. There's one step pad. There's another step pad, three step pads, and then the rumble seat would be inside here. So check out how these brake lights are designed. And just look at all of the different textures you can see inside the brake light lens itself. Bumpers are very basic but extremely elegant. Just notice how this door is designed to fit right there underneath the convertible top. The door panel has a nice leather feel to it. Lock and unlock the door. Door handle to pull the door shut. Window crank for the big window. Notice it's all framed out. This is the door handle to get out. These door handles look very modern for the era. This is 1930. This looks like 1980s. Very interesting design. Coming down inside the pedal box down here. Clutch, brake, gas pedal. Starter button down there. Like starter pedal, more like it. His glove box. Just take a look at this interior. There is an armrest in the center. How quaint. This here controls the spotlight. Here is what over the hood would look like. Here is what first person over the hood would look like. On to the button switches and knobs. All the gauges are in the center. Engine turn dash, needles, art deco. Also notice that the needle goes the opposite direction in which we're used to. Zero is on the right instead of on the left. Top speed traceable that is from this speedometer is 120 miles an hour, even though this car is only good for 105 miles an hour. Oil pressure, coolant temperature gauge, Marmon 16 plaque, just in case you forget what car you or your chauffeur is driving this very day. Lighter, ashtray, amp meter, gasoline gauge, clock, bottom right corner is for the spotlight controller, horn, check out that crest, key, hand throttle, choke, starter, headlights, clock winder. Up above, there are no sun visors, but you do have one windshield wiper motor, and then that bar brings that other windshield wiper along with it. Rear view mirror and center attached to the top of the windshield. Let's take a real quick gander at this engine. Absolutely stunning V16. Four knurled bits on the top are the valve cover fasteners. Exhaust comes out the side and goes down the bottom. Stromberg two barrel downdraft carburetor in the center with air cleaner attached. All of the spark plugs run inside a tube, keeping the engine bay nice and clean and tidy. Generator with shaft at the rear, which runs the water pump.
On the positive side, Art Deco 1930s modern styling, exclusive, understated elegance, outstanding performance, design and engineering paragon, CCCA classic status. Even though some consider this to be a failure, at least Marmon went out in style. This was their swan song and crown jewel of the brand and what Marmon is known for to this very day. Tons of aluminum used in the construction of the body as well as engine against it. All have been spoken for long, long ago. They rarely come up for sale. And when they do, most of the time they change hands privately. Rarely come up for sale publicly, but when they do, they go for an eye-watering price. I don't even think Leno has one and you'd have to be financially well off like Leno to buy, maintain, high maintenance costs, high operating costs and insurance costs would be astronomical for this car. All right, now it's time for Would You Rather. Two scenarios today. In the first scenario, would you rather have a 1931 Cadillac V16 or 1931 Marmon V16 or 1932 Peerless V16, even though this one only had is one of one, which one would you rather have? I'm going to leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free, pause the video. On to the second scenario, a bit outside the box, but which one would you rather have? 1931 decked out Packard Twin 6 or a 1931 Marmon 16 or 1931 Pierce Arrow V12 optioned out. I'm going to leave this here for a minute. If you need more time, feel free. Pause the video. Now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to get both the name of the band and the song title correctly in the comment section will have their comment pinned to the top of it. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below, or you can always email me at what underscore it's underscore like at yahoo.com. Be sure to stick around for the Marmon V16 episode, which is coming up right after this one. Until then, toodaloo!